Welcome, this is Dr. Owen Anderson, and we're talking today about atheism and next about agnosticism. So we'll go over both of those. And really, what is the question? What is atheism? And, and we're thinking about it here in the context of the 20th century. So atheism in the 20th century and the, the way it interacts with, it thinks about religion. And I began by asking if you're an atheist and making a prediction about how many atheists there are. Not, it's not similar to the polls. If you look at the polls or the statistics that are done by sociologists, uh, I think the number is much higher than that. And so we want to figure out why. Why does he think that? And, and how would you even make such a prediction? Those polls are based on going around and asking people, what are you? And they fill out a little check sheet of religions, and they might put down none or uh, atheism. And I'm going to talk about the difference between those two. But the, the point is, that requires you having self-knowledge. And you might not know yourself. And so my predict that's, that's the first hint at how I'm making my prediction, is that you may not know yourself as well as you think you do. Part of education is self-discovery, growth in consciousness. And so it might turn out that you're not what you thought you were. And then with that information, you can decide what to do. You might say, oh, I'm not what I thought it was, and I'm really happy with it when it turns out that I am. Or you might say, oh, I'm not what I thought it was. I better make some changes. That's a whole, that's kind of a separate question. This question is just self-knowledge. How do we know ourselves? So atheism could mean a few different things. Meanings could just mean philosophical materialism. We've seen this from the days of the Greeks. The first philosopher, Thales, was a materialist. He said, all is water. And then you have others, including the atomists, which are similar to us today, the atomists. Only atoms and the void space exist, Lucretius. And you might have Epicurus. There is no God and there is no soul. Do what makes you happy. So philosophical materialism. may have heard of those. And then you might think about it as a uh, uh, pop culture. Any way you want it, that's the way you need it. Or um, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. So you might think about it that way. Someone could say, I'm an atheist. And you might say, oh, so you, you believe only atoms and a void exist. And say, I don't know what you're talking about. I just think that the point of life is to do what you want. So oftentimes this involves the idea of rebellion against authority figures. So it's a Lucifer versus God. And that's the idea. Philosophical materialism. And then pop culture. I think it's thinking about a lot of other examples of that, but this comes out more in a uh, lifestyle choice rather than expressed as a philosophical creed. They may or may not be able to express it philosophically, but they think about it as a, a way of life. And then you can think about it as simply the absence of God.
And so here I'm thinking about a religious atheist. Or let me say this way, uh, quote, a moral atheist. And I put that in quotes because it, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later in the lecture, but yeah, for some time people would make the case, if you're atheist, you can't be moral. So number two up there might set out to prove that wrong as part of the rebellion. They'll say, well, I'm going to rebel against that and prove to you I can be moral and an atheist. But number three is more just like, this is a moral person and God doesn't enter into their considerations. So you look at their life. They live as if there is no God. So what does that mean? Well, here, let's, let's, uh, let me say, they may, they might say, there is a God, but he is distant, not concerned with what we do. Unknowing. Ah, moral, any one of them, some combination or any one of those individually or together. So that you might say, that's weird. How could they say they're an atheist? And yet they, some of them might say there's a God. Well, because of this part, yeah, God doesn't enter into their considerations. They are, uh, as you say, for all intents and purposes, there is no God. God doesn't do anything. So if you're playing checkers, and there is no God, the rules are the same as if you're playing checkers and there is a God. To know what to do in checkers, you don't consult God, you consult the checkers rule book. So you don't need to know if there's God. You take turns, you move diagonal, you jump if the diagonal square behind your opponent's open. If you get to the back squares, you get a queen, which means you can go forward and backward. Right, that's all you need to know for checkers. What if God doesn't exist? Well, if God doesn't exist, you move diagonal, you jump over your opponent if there's a diagonal square open behind them, and if you get to the back, back squares, you become a queen. See how it's the same either way? Doesn't matter. So this person might say, look, I'm not saying only matter exists. I'm not saying uh, one way or the other. Just that even if God exists, doesn't matter. God doesn't do anything. Where's God? So you can kind of divide these three this way. This is a metaphysical view. about what is real. This is an ethical view about how to live. And this is a epistemological view. About what we know. So we want to find out, okay, so that's, that's a, there's now the question, how do you know if you're an atheist? Could there be agnostics? People who don't know one way or the other. That's what that word means from the Greek word for knowledge. And then ah, 
Ah, uh, no stick, not, no knowledge. So we can say, I just don't know either way. Well, they're probably thinking about number one. The agnostic and saying they don't know if all is matter or not. But that's not how we tell if someone's a, if someone's an atheist. We look at number two, especially. We can work backwards from lifestyle choices and ethics, which is kind of means the same thing actually, just be, because you may not be familiar with the word ethics. Ethics just means the choices you make. So the way you choose to build your life on these choices, we can look at that and see. Say, all right, I'm curious here. Am I an atheist? And there'd be pretty easy to determine things. Uh, we can look and see if the person does what God tells people to do. So let's just pick Christianity, and we could really pick any theistic religion. Here, we're talking about God here. So we're not talking about monistic religions like Buddhism or Hinduism. Or we're talking about theistic religions. So we could look at Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. And you can look at someone's life and see. They might say, I, I don't know if Judaism is true or not. I, I just don't know. I'm an agnostic. But you can look and see, do they live as if Judaism is true, or do they live as if Judaism is false? Right, And from their actions, you can get to know them. And maybe you've heard that before. Maybe that was given to you as dating advice. Actions speak louder than words. Right? But she says she loves me. Actions speak louder than words. So you can look at that and see, how does someone live? So let's think about Christianity, right? Just think about just only Sunday of the week that's all just look at sunday because there's, there's other things you would do if you're a christian besides on sundays but let's just look at sunday does the person go to church does the person worship god with other christians does the person uh what I've said with church here, let me summarize what that means in the next two. You're worshiping at church, and uh, does the person engage in public prayer, in giving to their church, in serving with their church? So if you're an agnostic and you don't know if God exists or not, then you this is sort of referring to something called Pascal's wager. There's misuses of Pascal's wager and there's accurate uses of Pascal's wager. So you don't know if God is real or not. So therefore you sleep in, order pizza and watch NFL on Sundays. You don't seem to be understanding what you're dealing with then. Let me give an analogy. I don't know if this bucket by the computer contains uranium. So I'm going to sit next to it and hug it. You don't understand what uranium is then, right? If it is in there, it's going to destroy you. So if that bucket possibly contains uranium, get out as fast as you can and get someone who has a lead suit on to dispose of it. So now back to God. I don't know if there's a God or not, so I'm not going to live as if there is one at all. Then you don't seem to understand the implications of that, right? You could be an agnostic and say, I'm going to play it safe. I'm getting up, I'm going to early service. I'm staying to help clean for the next service. I'm helping with spaghetti lunch, right? I'm just, you, you could really go all out, right? To say, I'm being safe, just like I would with that uranium. They give you like two uh, plastic gloves here. Can you go get the uranium? No, I'm not going to do that. I need like an eight layered lead suit. Now, actually they wouldn't do that these days. They just have a drone, right? A little robot with a robot arm that gets it and moves it around. So uh, 
that's what you can look at. And someone says, I'm always curious because whenever someone tells me they're an atheist, guess what they don't do? I mean, an agnostic. I've never met an agnostic that says, since I don't know, I'm going to go to church. It's always the opposite. Since I don't know, I'm not going to church. So that's what tells me, well, there's really just two views and there's atheism and theism. And the lifestyle choice says, well, I'm going to choose, I'm going to fall onto not doing anything God uh, says to do. And you could do the same thing with any religion, right? Of theistic religions. I don't pray on Fridays. I don't attend mosque on Fridays. I don't pray five times a day towards Mecca. But I'm agnostic about Islam. Well, no, you're not. Your lifestyle shows that you don't think it's true. Because if you thought it's maybe true, then you do those things. So you, you can look and see what a person does to see what they think is true or not. So the idea seems to be, um, I'm not going to do it unless I know. I don't know. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. And you could reverse this. And you do in important cases. You could just as easily say, since I don't know, I'm going to do it. Right? And that's how we treat important things. I mentioned uranium. Now, you might say uranium is a very rare element. And so it's highly improbable that there's any in the bucket. So we don't live as if there's secret uranium in the room. So take, for, take something more common, gun safety. One of the first rules of gun safety is you always assume a gun is loaded. Well, why? You don't ever goof off with a gun, right? Say, ha ha, I'm holding you up and pointing at somebody. Why? Because the consequences are so serious. Maiming or death right? And that happens common enough that that's a real deal. And anyone who, who enjoys guns, they'll nevertheless tell you the first rule, you don't treat it like a toy, you pretend like it might be loaded until you double check, right? Don't pretend you think it is loaded until you double check. So that's a common example that you would say, yeah, how about driving? You keep up on your car if it's a, make sure it's not a hazard. You don't get behind the wheel impaired. I might, I might be good to drive. I think, I think there's been enough time since, since uh, then, and I can just drive now. Well, the consequences are so serious, you should err on the other side, right? Imagine if airline pilots treated airlines this way. How's the engine? I think it's pretty good. Did you check it? Yesterday. I think they check them in between the flights, right? Some, some minimal like checklist they have. So anyway, just the example, just the examples are all the same in essence, which is if something's important, then we would always err on the side of double checking and safety first. Now that doesn't solve this problem though. I don't know. So it's going to get worse. All right. I'm taking you here through a couple of loops when Atheism, oh wait, uh, I'm an agnostic. No, there aren't any agnostics, you're an atheist. And therefore you should side, you should be careful and side on the side of theism with the Pascal wager thing. But now going for another loop, ready? If we can't know, then there is no meaning in life. And if there is no meaning in life, then it doesn't matter if you attend church or not. We aren't different than the animals. All of life is vanity, meaninglessness. 
So now we're back up here to number two and the atheist Bible. Therefore, do what you want. Why care about consequences or playing it safe? That's what Ned Flanders does. If we can't know, there is no meaning. And this really introduces us and gets us into 20th century existentialism and atheism. So this would say, fideism, blind belief and action is no better than nihilism, which says no meaning. So fideism is no better than nihilism. We aren't really all that different than the animals when it comes down to it. That's all we are. Now you might point out, well, wait a minute, you're making a claim here about us. So you're claiming to know something. And you might say, well, I'm just making a comparison. You see the animals, you see us. The animals lead a meaningless life. You might say it's a good life if you have this pampered pet in your house who gets fed canned food four times a day, just lazes about all the time. So that's a really good life. Eh. Self-indulgence isn't a good life. They were, that, that animal is probably a calf, by the way I'm describing it. And cats with all of their muscle and, and uh, agility were made to lay around eating canned food all day. You've actually deprived it of its nature is meant to go outside and, and because it's hungry to be ferocious. When you take away the hunger, you take away the uh, energy. So now that's just a kind of indulgence. We, we uh, live for a while, indulge ourselves and die. And so how will we find meaning? The existentialist, we must make, we must have meaning. That's the first point. I'll number them. One, we must have meaning. Two, there is no meaning in the world. So three, we must make our own meaning. We determine what is meaningful for ourselves. Now, perhaps you heard when you were young, maybe you're in preschool or high school or uh, kindergarten. I wonder why I had a Freudian slip of high school and kindergarten is basically the same thing. Um, and someone told you, when you grow up, you can be anything you want. Now, that was career advice, not ontology advice. You're being told, if you want to be a dentist, nothing is stopping you. You can be a dentist. If you want to be a fighter pilot, nothing's stopping you. If you want to be a quarterback in the NFL, nothing's stopping you. Now, especially those last two, that might not be true. I don't think I could have done either one of those. I don't know if there's an official height restriction on being a fighter pilot, but it seems like it. Height and body size limits on being a fighter pilot. Eye agility, hand-eye coordination. Those might be things you're born with or without. So I'd sign up and they'd say, nah. Quarterback's probably the same, but I don't know. People work hard. What was, what was Tom Brady? Tenth round draft pick? Oh, man. They messed up on those first nine, didn't they? So hard work does take you a long ways. So we can, this, is, this isn't that though. This isn't career advice. You can be whatever you want. This is ontology advice, which seems to be how people understand it now. When they say, you can be anything you want, say, oh, I want to be a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Well, then you can be. 
That's ontology advice about being. And what you can be, I don't know if the army confused that also, be all that you can be, find your future. Remember that? In the army. That was an 80s commercial for the army. They were much more upbeat and happy commercials back then. Now the commercials are about absurdity. Some really annoying guy and his emu. And then there's, you're supposed to buy his insurance at the end of it. Well, you just annoyed me for 15 seconds. The last thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna purposely hunt out your competitors and buy their insurance to try to put an end to these commercials. But back then they had happy commercials with uh, little songs. So the army though, again, the army was giving you career advice. Wanna be an Apache uh, pilot? You can do it. Apache uh, fighter helicopter, right? You wanna be a tank driver? You wanna be general? Go for it. But now they might take it as, I want to actually be the tank. That's ontological advice. And that's coming out of existentialism. We determine what we are. We determine what is good and evil for ourselves. So there's a few different views of this. This is coming out of someone like Nietzsche. That's the late, I think he dies in 1900. So that's the late 19th century. Then there might be uh, Sartre, French, and We determine our essence. And there can be Camus and beauty. Meaning in the experience of beauty. And it could be uh, Huxley and uh, psychedelic. We find meaning in a experience, a religious experience. And since those are rare, only the select few seem to get these experiences. What we do instead is we, uh, you have to kind of jumpstart the experiences with something like LSD. Combine LSD with psychedelic rock and you'll get the experience. So the drug culture. And LSD was, was invented, promoted by a Harvard professor. Say, uh, oh no, oh yeah, Timothy Leary. Get him up here too. Is that right? Oh, L-E-A-R. Yeah, L-E-A-R. The drug experience. Now that he he kind of uh, takes us back into the occult, because Timothy Leary said that he's the reincarnation of. Um, oh, now I forget what's the guy's name. The worst. He said he's the worst human who ever lived. The great beast. I'll remember it before we're finished. Alistair Crowley. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed that ever there was a, if you ever heard of the show Supernatural and there were bad guys in it, demon bad guys, and one of them was named Alistair and then the more popular one is named Crowley. So they're being silly with things you may not know about. So existentialism and consistently living so the existentials would say, have the integrity to live as if there is no meaning, no knowledge, no purpose, 
no value, etc. So they're calling you out of it. They would say most people are atheists, but they're afraid. Most people think this way, but they're afraid of human convention, social pressure, fear of the unknown. Uh, you can't be afraid of fear of the unknown, but they're uh, afraid of the unknown. They have fear of the unknown. And so say, so just have integrity. Be consistent with what you claim to think. And live this way. So sometimes the existentialists would put tests for themselves. Like if there is no meaning, death is the same as life. And so you'd have a romantic character in the Hemingway novels, a bullfighter. I think they've fallen out of that now. They're not viewed as ethical. But back then, this was the romantic figure fighting the bull. And you can get to the point where you wrestle the bull into submission and you put his horn right up against your face. So the slightest jerk from the bull will impale you and kill you as a sign of you've dominated, but living or dying doesn't matter. They're the same thing. And the bull can decide, a brute beast, an animal. And that's not because you're depressed. Like, oh, I don't like living. No, you're just being consistent. There's no meaning. And so life and death are the same thing. Or will yourself to do something against social morality. So you might think, I'm going to do a really heinous act, heinous from the perspective of my society. I'm walking up the stairs, and as I look ahead of me, I see an old woman coming down the stairs toward me. And so I think to myself, if there is no meaning, morality is the same as immorality, then my pushing her down the stairs as we pass is the same as my not pushing her down the stairs as we pass. And so if I really had integrity, I would act against my only, my only reason for not pushing her is I'm afraid of, of human conventions. What will the people around me think? They'll gasp and shock. And they might throw me into prison. But none of those matter either. In prison, I can lead a meaningless life just as well as outside of prison. So if you really were consistent, you would will yourself to cast her down the stairs as you passed. And far from making you a degenerate, that makes you into a superman. And these are the kinds of deliberations the character Roskolnikov is thinking about in crime and punishment. Is there really such thing as crime? And if I'm a great man, like Napoleon, he was a superman. This is what was Konikov thinking. And he did what he wanted. He willed power. He lived above social conventions. And I hope you know, you're not saying Napoleon Hua. And you're not saying, oh yeah, Napoleon Dynamite. He's that character... No, Napoleon, the great general who conquered Europe. And so Roskonikov's not in charge of an army, so he decides, I'm going to do something that also puts me above the morality of my society. I'm going to get an axe. And I know this old woman, she owns a pawn shop. And I know when she gets home, because I've been watching her. And when she gets home, I'll be waiting and I'll bludgeon her to death. It has to be with an ax because it has to be personal and up close because I'm repulsed by the very idea. And so I have to overcome my repulsion by this up close and bloody murder. 
And so that's setting the stage. So you'll now read the book, Crime and Punishment to find out what happens. That's only the first third. I haven't ruined it for you. But he's living out this idea of having integrity. If there is no meaning, live like it. So you'll notice these two things have been doing the same thing. Back up here. Uh, if you can't know there's any meaning in life, then why not go to church? And the response is, because I have to have integrity. And going to church is the same as not going to church. There's no meaning. Now, I mentioned Camus and beauty because Camus is like a softened version of this because he would say there's beauty in the world. And he has a famous book, The Stranger. And then later on, The Cure wrote a uh, song of The Stranger. And it's about a man just randomly killing another man. And the sergeant, the, the officer, trying to figure out why'd you do it? So most of it is the dialogue between them. Well, why'd you kill that man? And there isn't a why. It's even different than the animals because most of the time, maybe 99.9% .9 of the time, you know the answer why the animal do that. It was hungry. There's three answers. It was mating, it was hungry, it was afraid. That'll explain all, all, all animal behavior, right? But the existentialist in the stranger puts himself outside of even those. He wasn't doing any of those things. He wasn't afraid. His life wasn't threatened. But he's having integrity and willing an act that's meaningless. So Camus' answer to that, Camus saw you can't live that way, even though he's writing that. So The Stranger is a little bit of a, a reductio book. He believes, number one, and number two. And the way he says we do number three is with finding beauty that's in the world. He also wrote a book called The Plague. And you should read The Plague to, to, to see what you just went through with COVID. I read it with my great books reading group during COVID, and it was predicting exactly what was going to happen. It was, it was a bit scary. So you can read The Plague. And uh, it's not really just about a plague, though. It's about human existence. We're plagued to exist. So his solution, though, is that in the experiences of beauty, and then you can see sort of how Aldous Huxley and Timothy Leary are versions of that, because you might say, yeah, but my brain chemistry doesn't give me experiences of beauty enough. Well, we've got something for you that will help you with the brain chemistry. And you can see the rise. I mean, the last 50 years, 60 years, one of the major expenses and social events is the war on drugs and still raging today. Billionaires are made. Cartels are given strength to combat drugs. And why is there the other way to combat drugs is this way. Demand. What if there's no demand? How much do our people paying for the dirt over in the empty lot? They're paying nothing for it because there's no demand for dirt from the empty lot. So what if you took away demand? Why is there demand? Because my life is empty. And this makes me feel better. So if you say, well, my life is so packed full of meaning, I actually don't have time to do drugs. I mean, if, I, if some time clears up, maybe I'll do drugs, but... My life's filled with, with uh, meaningful activities. And the kinds of meaningful activities I do would all be hampered by drugs. So I try to avoid drugs. I always ask when I go to this restaurant, are there any drugs in this water? Because I don't want to be hampered in my activities. So you can see that though, my life is empty and so I need drugs. So the feediest solution is uh, not only insufficient, 
but proves the point of the nihilist. If there's a solution, it must be in showing how knowledge is possible so that we can have meaning. Inventing your own meaning is the same as not inventing your own meaning. So really nihilism is non-being. And if you exist, you can't do non-being. If you exist, you're going to do something. Even laying around on the couch all day, watching daytime TV is doing something. You can't actually do nothing. And so that's to say, tells us that nihilism is a non-starter and knowledge must be possible now we need to find it. Get knowledge. Get understanding. Seek wisdom. So I've taken you through a trail of atheism slash agnosticism through the fideist Pascal's wager response to 20th century existentialism and now to the end, which says, well, we can't do that. And so we have to get wisdom. Now, let me add in one more thing up here, um, religious existentialism. So I mentioned Dostoevsky and a lot of people would put him in religious existentialism. Kierkegaard's another one. Bonhoeffer. And you'll have existentialist theology. And there's the encounter of the other, the religious experience. But again, this tends to be fideistic. It's not pure existentialism, which is why it didn't occur to me at first to put it on here. Because they'll say, I'm doing religion, I'm going to church, looking for this experience to find meaning in my life, or it'll be confirmed in the afterlife. That's when you'll know, is when you die. Oh, I don't exist. I guess the materialist was right. There is no soul. And so... Those who seek the religious experience will say, well, it doesn't happen enough, and that's why you might combine it with this. Then I'll get the religious experience. But that's not going to do it for us. Instead, we're going to have to get knowledge. And that's really the crisis of the 20th century. An age of uncertainty, skepticism, nihilism, where you see the masses turning this way and that way, looking for something to latch onto to give themselves some meaning. And so the question of the 21st century is, will we uh, repeat this or do we find a solution? And it should say a repeating always involves a descent. It's not just the same thing. You tried this, it didn't work. If you're going to keep doing it, you need to intensify it and intensify it and intensify it. More and more and more. So the analogy for that would be uh, the, the high rate of drug overdoses. 
this amount's not doing it. I need more. So the 21st century has to ask that question. Uh, we are currently seeing the unfolding of that and seeing which way things will go. Did we learn something from the 20th century? Specifically, did we learn how to find knowledge and meaning? Or are we still left without it, wandering as a stranger in the world? <laughs>